You know when he's out there, there's going to be energy. Uh, some of it might be bad, but more, more of it is, most of it is good, and most of it is good for the team. He epitomized the 90s New York Knicks. His heart and hustle made him a fan favorite, and whether he was outmatched in size, talent, or both, he took the challenge head on, never letting anyone intimidate him. A hounding perimeter defender, perfect for Pat Riley's Knicks who could also catch fire on the offensive end on any given night. And although he could be very streaky, he's one of the most underrated three-point threats of the 90s. But that didn't mean he was afraid to go inside, because if John Stark saw a hole, he was going to the cup with bad intentions. He would barrel down the court seemingly out of control, and sometimes he was, but plenty of times he was finishing a layup before the defense had time to react. He was a perfect example of a guy you hated if he was on the other team, but loved if he was on yours. Yet he didn't care if you hated him. He didn't take anything for granted and did whatever he had to to stick around for over a decade in the NBA. But he did more than stick around. As one of the greatest New York Knicks and one of the most underrated two guards in NBA history, John Starks is certainly not forgotten, but doesn't always get remembered for how good he really was. Let's jog your memory. A Tulsa native, John Starks would move around often as a child, as money was tight in the Starks household. John would attend Central High School in Tulsa, but would only play on the basketball team as a junior, before quitting after a less than stellar season. But he also had to worry about his family, as while he might have been able to play as a senior, he had priorities, and would instead work at a loading dock to help provide for his family. Yet he would still head to Cheyenne Park to play pickup ball whenever he had spare time. But basketball did not look to be in Starks' future after graduating, and he would also say in a later interview that he just wasn't ready for college. But he did it for his mom, as he would enroll at Rogers State College the following fall in hopes of obtaining a degree. But while he was there, he would get a spot on the school's taxi team, which was essentially a practice squad, as players would get a chance to play if anyone on the regular roster was injured. Yet Starks would never see the court for Rogers State, as he would be expelled. In retaliation for another student breaking into Starks' dorm, he would steal this student's stereo equipment, with the university holding him responsible for the damages, as Starks would even spend five days in jail for the robbery. But it was on to the next school, which would be Northern Oklahoma University, as he enrolled in the spring. Then during fall, he would play for Northern Oklahoma, and was showing his skill, but he would again be kicked out of school, this time for smoking weed in his dorm. So at this point, it seemed that Starks had used up his chances to pursue a basketball career, as he would enroll at Tulsa Junior College with the intention to complete a business degree while working as a grocery bag boy. With Starks' life looking like it was going to be pretty ordinary, but a stroke of luck would give his basketball dreams new life. While playing intramural basketball, he would catch the eye of former Oral Roberts coach Ken Tricky, who happened to be starting a basketball team at Oklahoma Junior College and wanted Starks to play for him. And with no room for error, Starks would make the most of it. He would play for Tricky during the 87 season and would again catch the eye of the right people. As Oklahoma State Cowboys coach Leonard Hamilton would notice Starks and offer him a scholarship for the 88 season. As after four universities, Stark had made it to D1 basketball. The Cowboys were coming off an 8 and 20 season, but in addition to Starks, were also bringing in freshman recruit Richard Dumas as these two would make up a lot of the Cowboys offense this year. Starks would act as the team's starting two guard this year and would finish second on the team in scoring and first in assists and steals. Additionally, he showed his long range ability by leading the team with 108 three point attempts while making 38% of them. But it would still be years until OSU became a real threat as they would finish with a 14 and 16 record and lose to Kansas in the first round of the Big 8 tournament, which marked the end of their season as Starks' year had seen him average about 15.5 points, 4.5 rebounds, and 4.5 assists per game. So even though it wasn't a great team season for OSU, Starks made the most of his chance and caught the eye of some NBA scouts, as he would be confident enough to enter the 88 NBA draft. Starks was on the radar, but barely, as he would go undrafted. But his dreams weren't over, as about a month before the 89 season, Don Nelson decided to take a chance on Starks, as the Warriors would sign him. Golden State was building something, with star Chris Mullen and rookie Mitch Richmond, but Starks was buried on the bench, only seeing the floor in 36 games and playing a grand total of 316 minutes, before straining his back and appearing in his final game in late February. 
as the Warriors would finish with a 43-39 record before losing to Phoenix in the second round of the playoffs, with Starks not seeing any postseason action. But for his rookie season, Starks had averaged about 4 points, 1 rebound, and 1 assist per game. The Warriors would not re-sign Starks, but he would refuse to let his pro career end just like that. 1990 would see Starks bounce around leagues, as he would first play for the Cedar Rapids Silver Bullets of the Continental Basketball Association, averaging over 20 points and making the All-Star game, yet also making just $500 a month, which was a far cry from the $100,000 contract he had gotten as an NBA rookie. He would then get a pay bump after signing with the Memphis Rockers of the World Basketball League, as he received $5,000 per month in the WBL. But while Starks was fiery, scouts were still worried he was too fiery, as he had been suspended 5 games in the CBA for bumping a ref, which reportedly played a role in the Detroit Pistons deciding against offering Starks a 10-day contract near the end of the 1990 season. But in the fall of 1990, Starks got a call from the New York Knicks who needed a good practice player, but then one play in training camp would change the career and life of John Starks forever. Starks himself would say that he wasn't going to make the team, so in an attempt to go out with a bang, he tried to dunk on Knicks star center Patrick Ewing near the end of camp, but Ewing wasn't having any of that and laid out Starks, yet this resulted in Starks straining his knee, so instead of cutting him, New York had to put him on the injured list meaning he couldn't be cut until he was healed. But then Trent Tucker went down with an injury in early December, and with the Knicks thin at the guard position and Starks now healthy, he would suit up for his first game as a New York Knick on December 7, 1990 to take on the Chicago Bulls. Starks would have just four points in his debut, but his next two games versus Atlanta and Miami would see him drop 20 points in each as he had bought himself more time and would carve out a solid bench role on the Knicks this year, appearing in 61 games and even starting 10 of them. As the Knicks, with guys like Ewing, Charles Oakley, and Mark Jackson, were on the verge of becoming an Eastern Conference power throughout the 90s. But it wouldn't be just yet, as they only managed a 39-43 record, yet it was still enough for the final playoff spot in the East and they would play the Chicago Bulls in round one, essentially kicking off the Knicks-Bulls rivalry of the 90s. But you wouldn't know it yet, as Chicago ran through New York in a sweep, as Starks wouldn't get any meaningful minutes for the series. But for his first season in New York, he finished with averages of about 7.5 points, 2 rebounds, and 3.5 assists per game. 92 would be a huge step forward for New York, and a big reason for this was their new man at the end of the bench the great Pat Riley, who had won four titles as head coach of the Lakers throughout the 80s. But the Knicks would also add a couple players who would fit Riley's incoming defensive philosophy perfectly, with one of them being former All-Star Xavier McDaniel, and the other being a player who had a similar route to the NBA as Starks, in Anthony Mason. Under Riley, the Knicks would become one of the best defensive teams in the NBA, and Starks would play a part in that, as he would finish second on the team in steals with his relentless style of defense. But a more unexpected contribution from Starks was that he would also finish as the Knicks' second leading scorer. He would play in all 82 games, yet come off the bench for every one of them. He would hit double figures in 61 games and record two double doubles. And he showed his stuff early, as he would drop a season high 30 points in just the fourth game of the year, as by the end of the season, he would be top five in sixth man of the year voting. And while Starks was beginning to get recognition for his overall play, his athleticism was becoming well known, as he would get a spot in the 1992 slam dunk contest, where he would perform well and finish as a runner-up to Cedric Sabalos. The Knicks were 30-16 at the break and would go 21-15 the rest of the way, as they would finish the year at 51-31 and, and get a first round matchup with an aging Pistons team. This series would go the distance, but the Knicks would win in 5 to effectively close the door on the bad boys era. Starks would get a real role this postseason, as he would go over 24 minutes per game in the first round series, hitting double figures in 3 games, yet only shooting about 30% from the field. The second round would bring a rematch with the now defending champion Chicago Bulls, and Starks showed up in this series, finishing as the team's third leading scorer on improved 43% shooting, while also leading the team in steals. The Knicks would push the Bulls to 7 games, but lose in a blowout in Game 7. Starks was an instigator all series, trying his best to get under the Bulls' skin, but he was also hurting them on the offensive end, 
as he would hit double figures in four games and would close the series out on a high note as he would put up 27 points on 9 of 14 shooting with 5 steals in a Game 6 win to extend the series, then put up 18 points and 4 steals in the Game 7 loss. But the season ended with Starks averaging about 14 points, 2.5 rebounds, and 3.5 assists per game. But 1993 would be the year New York entered the league's elite, and Starks played a huge part in that. The Knicks no longer featured McDaniel, but made some additions by including Mark Jackson in a three-team trade to acquire point guard Doc Rivers and forward Charles Smith, and they would make a trade with Dallas for former All-Star Rolando Blackman. Starks would start the first eight games of the year before Riley decided to bring him off the bench again, with Blackman taking over starting duties. But in early February, Starks would re-enter the starting lineup for good and put up great numbers the rest of the way. But even including his time spent on the bench, Starks would again be the Knicks' second best scorer on greatly improved scoring, but he was also a true two-way player and would finish as one of seven Knicks in the league's top 20 for defensive rating, en route to being named second team all-defense, as Starks would be the only member of the league's top-ranked defense to make an all-defensive team this year, even seeing himself finish top five in DPOY voting. Starks would hit double figures in 69 games, which would include six games with at least 30, and his career high of 39 points along with 13 assists in a February 17th defeat of Charlotte, as this would mark one of his four double-doubles on the year. And his three-point shooting really started to become a big facet of his game, as he would have six games with at least four made threes during a year where the league average was three made threes per game. The Knicks as a whole would ride their top-ranked defense to the best record in the East at 60-22, as the top-seeded Knicks would get a first-round matchup with Indiana. In what would be the beginning of another 90s rivalry, New York would get the better of Indiana this time, winning the series in four games. Starks would come out with 13 points and 6 assists in a Game 1 win, then would go off in Game 2, with a team-high 29 points along with 11 assists, while helping hold Reggie Miller to below 43% shooting. A Game 3 blowout loss would see Starks finish with just 11 points, but then he would come back with 15 in Game 4, while making both his shots from deep as the Knicks advanced to a second round matchup with Charlotte. Starks again scored like he did in the regular season, but would also lead all players in assists with about 7.5 per game. He would have a 14 point 12 assist double double in a Game 1 win, then would follow that up with 25 points and 6 assists in a Game 2 overtime win. Game 3 would be a marathon, with Starks putting up 19 points and 8 assists, yet also shooting just 7 of 20 from the field and committing 7 turnovers, as the Knicks lost in double OT. Starks couldn't get anything going with just 7 points in Game 4, but the Knicks held on to win. Then in the series clinching Game 5, Starks finished with 20 points and 9 assists while making all 7 of his free throws, as New York won to advance to the conference finals, where yet again the Bulls were waiting for them. Starks was overmatched in virtually every way with Michael Jordan, but he did everything he could to make life miserable for the Bulls star. Starks would be the team's second leading scorer and again top distributor while shooting a very respectable 45% from the field and nearly 39% from deep. And although Jordan averaged over 32 points for the series, Starks played a big part in holding him to just 40% shooting. Starks came out hot in Game 1, with 25 points on over 57% shooting, along with 5 rebounds and 4 assists. He cooled off in Game 2 with just 12 points, but again added 9 assists. Yet Game 2 would also feature the most famous highlight of Starks' career. Seconds left in the fourth quarter. Starks! Yes! The Knicks again took care of business at home and were going to Chicago with a 2-0 lead with Jordan having shot a combined 22 for 59 across the first two games. Game 3 would see Starks go for just 8 points on 2 of 7 shooting, before being ejected in the second half of a blowout loss, after Starks became frustrated with a foul called on him, leading to him and Jordan getting into each other's faces. Yet he had still helped in holding Jordan to 3 of 18 shooting. Game 4 would see Starks drop 24 points and 7 assists, yet also commit 8 turnovers, in a 10 point loss which saw Jordan drop 54. Starks would have an inefficient 8 points in Game 5, yet would add 6 rebounds and 8 assists. However, the Knicks would lose their third straight, 
Starks would have 14, 5, and 5 in Game 7, but he again couldn't take care of the ball, committing 8 turnovers as the Bulls eliminated the Knicks for the third straight year. And while Starks probably couldn't have cared less, the league's best player was now fully aware of who he was. I don't even remember when he was in the CBA. I don't remember when he came into the league, but I know he's here now. But for the regular season, Starks averaged about 17.5 points, 2.5 rebounds, and 5 assists per game. But the 1994 season would see John Starks and the Knicks reach their peak. But would it be enough? The Knicks again featured the league's best defense, which was only boasted by the midseason acquisition of Derek Harper from Dallas, as they would allow less than 92 points per game. They were also one of the lowest scoring teams, with Ewing leading the way, yet Starks was not far behind, with a career high 19 points per game, while also leading the team in assists and steals as Starks would finish as one of five Knicks with a top 20 defensive rating. In his first 59 games, he would hit double figures in 54 of them, while recording eight games with at least 30 and matching his career high of 39 points in a January 1st defeat of Orlando. And his three-point shooting was again one of his best weapons, made evident in a November 22nd defeat of Miami when he had 37 points and went 7 of 10 from deep and his career year would earn him a spot in the 1994 All-Star Game. But his season would come to an end shortly after that, as about a month after the break, he would tear the cartilage in his left knee in a game versus Atlanta, as it would ultimately require surgery, which he underwent in mid-March, meaning his regular season was over, as New York just hoped he would be ready for the playoffs. And after a 57-25 finish, the Knicks would take on the Nets in Round 1. And luckily for New York, Starks was back come Game 1 yet would begin the postseason in a bench role. Starks would ease back into the lineup by coming off the bench for all of the first round series. He was rusty to begin, as he had a combined 9 points on 2 of 11 shooting in the first two games. But the Knicks took both. Game 3 saw him go for 15 points on 5 of 9 shooting in a loss, and then in Game 4, he would play 32 minutes and score 16 points off the bench as the Knicks wrapped up the series and were heading to the second round to take on Chicago. However, the difference with this Bulls team was that they no longer featured Michael Jordan, who was now trying his hand in baseball. But the Scottie Pippen-led Bulls weren't just going to roll over. Once again, New York won the first two games as Starks came off the bench to average 15 points, yet would shoot a combined 7 of 23. Then a Game 3 loss would see him go for 21 points, 6 assists, and 4 steals. And at this point, Starks' knee seemed like it was healed. So Riley put him back into the starting lineup for Game 4. But he didn't start lighting it up, as he would average just 13 points on less than 40% shooting across the next 4 games. As the series went the distance, but the Knicks would take it in 7, even though Starks went just 2 for 11 in the deciding game. The conference finals brought the Pacers, and once again the Knicks were in for a battle. Starks started slow, going just 1 of 7 from the field in Game 1, yet the Knicks got the win. He would then have 9 points on 50% shooting in Game 2, as New York went up 2-0. The Knicks would drop Game 3 in Indiana, as Starks went just 2 of 8 from the field and had 12 points. He continued to show slight improvement, with a 14-point, 4-assist performance in a Game 4 loss. Then even though he had 16 points and 8 assists in Game 5, the Knicks lost their third in a row, as their backs were now against the wall. But Starks came through with a team-high 26 points on nearly 73% shooting while hitting 5 threes in a Game 6 win to force a Game 7. Starks would finish with 17 points in a game that went down to the wire. And with about 30 seconds left and the Knicks down 1, Starks got the angle and took it to the hoop to put the Knicks ahead. So Ewing would get the glory with the putback as the Knicks were now in the lead. But what's often left out is how Starks would go to the line twice in the final 5 seconds and hit 3 out of 4 free throws to ice the game and the series, as New York was heading to their first NBA Finals in over 20 years. Waiting for them was another team led by a top tier center in Hakeem Olajuwon and the Houston Rockets. And for the third straight series, the Knicks would be pushed to the full 7 games. Starks had a rough game 1 with 11 points on just 3 of 18 shooting, in a loss. But after this, he would lock in. Game 2 would see Starks finish with 19 points on 6 of 11 shooting while adding 9 assists and 3 steals in a win. Back in New York, the Knicks would fall behind 2-1, yet Starks would finish with 20 points and 9 assists. New York would even it with a Game 4 win as Starks finished with 20 points on over 54% shooting. 
that in Game 5, he had an all-around performance with 19 points, 7 rebounds, 6 assists, and 3 steals, as the Knicks took the game and were one win away from a championship. And Game 6 would see Starks do everything he could to get them that ring, as back in Houston, he would put up a team-high 27 points along with 8 assists while shooting 5 for 9 from deep. But it was the final missed 3 that hurt the most, as with the Knicks down 2, Starks had a seemingly open look at a game-winning 3. So Olajuwon had saved the Rockets season, and then Game 7 would become the darkest day of Starks' career. On June 22, 1994, John Starks wouldn't be able to make a shot if his life depended on it, as he would go 2 of 18 from the field and 0 for 11 from deep, as he managed just 8 points for the game, and his ice-cold performance was a killer for the Knicks, who would lose the game by 6 and miss out on a championship. And while this has become the most infamous moment of Starks' career, it's really unfortunate because the Knicks wouldn't even have been in that position had it not been for his performance in games 2 through 6. As prior to Game 7, he had a real case for Finals MVP, but his regular season had seen him average about 19 points, 3 rebounds, and 6 assists per game. 1995 would see much of the same from the Knicks, as they continued as one of the league's premier defensive teams. But it seemed that Starks' Game 7 might have really shaken his confidence, as while he hadn't exactly been the most efficient shooter throughout his career, this year would be especially rough, as he would shoot below 40% from the field. But this was also the first of three years that the NBA experimented with a shorter three-point line, and Starks took advantage of that, as he led the league with 611 attempted threes, and his 217 made threes would lead the league as well, and make him the first player in history to hit at least 200 threes in a season, as he shot over 35% from beyond the arc. He would still act as the team's second leading scorer, but had seen a more than three-point decrease from last year. Nonetheless, Starks would hit double figures in 61 games and drain a then-career-high 8 three-pointers in a January 10th defeat of Indiana as he finished the game with 31 points. The Knicks were getting older and Oakley would miss 32 games this year, but they were still one of the best teams in the East as they would finish with a 55-27 record which would get them a first-round matchup with Cleveland. Starks would be up and down this series as after scoring just 7 points in a Game 1 win, he would come back with 21 in a Game 2 loss then would follow that up with just 9 points in a Game 3 win. But he came through in the closeout Game 4 by going 5 for 7 from deep to finish with 15 points in a win, as the second round brought a familiar foe in the Indiana Pacers. This would be one of Starks' better playoff performances, as the series went the distance, with Starks averaging about 17 points and 5 assists on over 45% from the field and over 41% from deep, while also helping to hold Reggie Miller to around 43% shooting. Starks would go for 21 points and 7 assists in a Game 1 loss, then go for 19 points in a Game 2 win. He would go off in Game 3 with 23 points, 9 assists, and 3 steals, while going 7 for 11 from beyond the arc. But the Pacers would win by 2. The next 3 would see Starks shoot below 39% and only average about 12.5 points. But the Knicks would go 2-1 in those games as the series was tied 3-all going back to New York. Starks would play well with 19 points and 3 assists on over 54% shooting in Game 7, but Ewing wouldn't be able to break the Pacers' hearts again this year, as his game-winning layup was too strong and New York lost by 2 to end their season. As Starks finished the year with averages of about 15.5 points, 2.5 rebounds, and 5 assists per game, but big changes were coming during the 1995 offseason. Disagreements with the front office led to Pat Riley leaving the Knicks to take a job with Miami, and New York would replace him with the man who gave Starks a chance years ago in Don Nelson, yet had also been the man to cut him. But prior to the year, Starks would reportedly have no issues with Nelson and was looking forward to his new offensive schemes. And Starks was also planning to be more aggressive this season, as he would say that the shortened three-point line and still being a little hesitant about his surgically repaired knee led to him depending too much on the long-range shot. And under Nelson, who was known for his fast-paced offenses, Starks would likely have more opportunity to be aggressive. And he did look more like the aggressive Starks of old, as he would take over 200 less three-point attempts this season and would shoot 44.3% from the field, which would be the second-highest mark of his career. 
His 10.4 shots per game would be his lowest total since his first year in New York, but he was taking smarter shots. And that's what was important. Starks would be one of six Knicks to average double figures, yet he would drop to the team's fourth leading scorer. But after coaching the Knicks to a 34-25 start, conflict between Nelson, Ewing, and the front office would lead to his firing as Jeff Van Gundy replaced him for the remainder of the season. But the season as a whole would still see Starks hit double figures in 49 games. Oakley would again miss time, and along with the coaching instability and inner conflict, New York would fail to win 50 games. But their 47-35 record would get them a first round matchup with Cleveland. This would be a closer series than it looked, but in the end the Knicks would sweep the Cavs, with Starks leading the way, as he would be the team's top scorer and distributor while shooting nearly 56% from the field, and over 63% from deep. He would go for 21 points, 7 assists, and 3 steals in Game 1, then 16 points and 7 assists in Game 2. Then in the closeout Game 3, he would drop 22 points along with 5 rebounds and 4 assists while shooting 7 of 11 from the field and 5 for 7 from deep, as the Knicks were set to take on the Bulls in Round 2. But now they featured number 23. Chicago was 72-10 this year, so New York's chances were slim to begin with. But it didn't help that Starks went 0 for 9 in a Game 1 loss, finishing with 4 points. He would play a bit better in Game 2, with 12 points and 4 steals, yet the Knicks would lose again. But it was the Knicks' lone win of the series in Game 3, when Starks played his best. Back in New York, Starks would try to counteract a 46-point performance from Jordan, as he would put up 30 points of his own on over 61% shooting, while adding 4 rebounds, 6 assists, and 3 steals. But that would be the outlier. As in games 4 and 5, he came back to earth, averaging 11.5 points on a combined 7 for 21 shooting, as the Knicks season came to another disappointing end. But Starks' regular season had seen him average about 12.5 points, 3 rebounds, and 4 assists per game. Van Gundy would remain as the Knicks coach in 97, but his game plan for Starks would be much different than usual. Some big offseason moves had the Knicks looking a lot different, as they had traded Anthony Mason to Charlotte, for former All-Star Larry Johnson. And then they would sign fourth-year guard Allen Houston in free agency. But Houston and Starks both played shooting guard, so a decision had to be made, and Van Gundy would elect to shift the 31-year-old Starks into a sixth-man role, and it really paid off. Starks would appear in 77 games in 97, yet would start just one of them, as he would get about 26 and a half minutes per game as a spark plug off the bench, upping his scoring to finish as the team's third-leading scorer. He would still hit double figures in 60 games, including 14 with at least 20. And the offseason moves would breathe some life into the Knicks, as they would put together three separate seven-game win streaks and have a 17-game stretch from early February to early March where they would go 15-2, as they were a more balanced offensive team who still possessed an elite defense, finishing with the third-best record in the East at 57-25. The first round would bring the Charlotte Hornets, but before that series kicked off, Starks would be honored with the 6th Man of the Year award for the 97 season, and the Knicks would proceed to sweep the Hornets, with Starks playing great. He would go for 19 points and 7 assists on over 57% shooting in Game 1, then follow that up with 14 points, 5 rebounds, and 4 assists in Game 2. And then he would round out the series with a 16-point performance while going 7 of 8 from the free throw line in Game 3, as the Knicks were heading through to a second round matchup with Miami, beginning yet another 90s Knicks rivalry. Starks wouldn't have the most efficient series, but he was still a valuable piece on both ends of the floor for New York, and the Knicks were cruising to begin the series. After the team split the first two games, with Starks putting up a combined 9 points, New York would take command, as they would win Game 3, as Starks had 11 points, then in Game 4 he would find his groove, with 21 points on 9 of 12 shooting in another win. So the Knicks were up 3-1, but heading for a loss in Game 5, as Starks had turned in another 21-point performance. But then, after PJ Brown flipped Charlie Ward during a Tim Hardaway free throw, many Knicks would clear the bench, leading to suspensions, as Starks, Ewing, Johnson, and Houston would be handed down punishments. But due to league rules requiring a team dress at least 9 players, they would stagger the suspensions. So Ewing and Houston would miss Game 6, with Starks putting up 15 points and 11 rebounds before fouling out late, in what would be a 5-point loss. 
and then with their season on the line, Starks would be watching from the bench alongside Johnson as they were serving their suspension, as Miami would end New York's year, with Starks' regular season ending with him averaging about 14 points, 2.5 rebounds, and 3 assists per game. The Knicks looked the same in 98, but age and injuries caught up to them in a big way, as Ewing suffered a wrist injury 26 games into the season and would miss the final 56 games. Starks remained in his sixth man role and was the team's third leading scorer among players who appeared in more than 26 games. He would hit double figures in 61 games, which included a January 29th loss to Milwaukee when he would drain a career high 9 three pointers en route to finishing with 32 points, as he would finish top 5 in six man of the year voting. Yet, his shooting had suffered this season as he had dropped to below 40% on the year. But this was a progressive drop as the final four months of the season would see a steep decline in his efficiency. But even with this, and the Knicks playing most of the year without Ewing, their stifling defense would only allow about 89 points per game, as they were able to manage a 43-39 record, which would get them the seventh seed in the East, and a rematch with Miami. The Knicks would still be without Ewing, but that didn't matter, as they would outlast Miami over five games. And in that time, Starks would rediscover his shot, as he would go for 14 points in Game 1, then 25 points on over 63% shooting in Game 2. The Knicks fell behind 2-1 after Starks had just 6 points and fouled out, but he would get back on track in Game 4, with 17 points on 50% shooting. Then the Knicks would get some help in Game 5, in the form of suspensions being served by both Larry Johnson and Alonzo Mourning due to a Game 4 fight as the Heat without mourning faltered in a 17-point loss, with Starks acting as a starter in this game and hitting five three-pointers, en route to 22 points and a series victory, as the second round would bring the Pacers. Ewing would return after Game 1, but he wasn't quite at full strength. Starks would start Game 1 and go for 17 points in a loss before returning to the bench, but in Game 2 he would have 20 points and go 4 of 5 from deep, yet the Knicks had lost both. They would get one at home in Game 3, as Starks had 12 points, but after a 19-point performance on nearly 64% shooting in a Game 4 loss, he would go just 2 of 10 from deep with 12 points in Game 5, as the Pacers wrapped up the series, with Starks' regular season seeing him average about 13 points, 3 rebounds, and 2.5 and assists per game. But little did Starks know, he had just played his final game as a New York Knick. The 1998 lockout had led to an extended offseason, and during that time, the Knicks were trying to figure out ways to keep their championship window open, and they decided to make a trade for a highly talented Latrell Sprewell, who was coming off a year-long suspension for an incident with his head coach in Golden State. So on January 21st, Starks would be included in a package which saw him end up back in Golden State over a decade later. Now Starks had gone from perennial playoff contender to a team coming off a 19-63 season. And while this was largely due to the absence of Sprewell, the Warriors still weren't going to be challenging for a title anytime soon. So a 33-year-old Starks would come in to help keep the Warriors somewhat competitive and act as a veteran example for the young players, like incoming rookie Antoine Jameson. Although Starks would average less than 14 points per game, he would lead his team in scoring for the first and only time in his career. But Starks wasn't able to create his shot the same way he used to, as he would shoot 37% from the field and 29% from deep. But he would still play and start in all 50 games and hit double figures in 41 of them while recording three double-doubles for a Warriors team who finished the year at 21-29 and, and missed the playoffs. As Starks' season ended with him averaging about 14 points, 3.5 rebounds, and 4.5 assists per game. Starks was again a warrior to begin the 2000 season, and he would actually up his scoring, while greatly improving his 3-point shooting, as he would appear in 33 of the Warriors' first 48 games, hitting double figures in 22 of them. But then around the trade deadline, Starks would be on the move in a 3-team trade, and he would be going to the place where he was once public enemy number 1. So Starks would end up in Chicago, donning the uniform of the team he had engaged in so many battles with throughout the 90s. But these Bulls were one of the worst teams in the league, and Starks wanted no part of another losing situation while in the twilight of his career. As while he would appear in four games for Chicago, he would request a trade. Unfortunately, the Bulls weren't able to find a trade partner by the deadline, which led to Starks requesting his release and offering to forfeit his salary to join a contender. 
but an arbitrator would veto this, saying that while Starks could forfeit his contract and leave the Bulls, he would be ineligible to join a playoff roster by the March 1st deadline, so Starks would instead decide to stay with the Bulls, until they would release him a couple weeks later, with GM Jerry Krause still paying him the remainder of his contract. As Starks' overall season had seen him average about 14 points, 2.5 rebounds, and 4.5 and assists per game. A now free agent Starks would sign with the Utah Jazz in the offseason, joining the ever-consistent John Stockton and Carl Malone. And Starks would play a substantial role with the team, as at 35 years old, he would appear in 75 games and start 64 of them, while shooting over 35% from deep. As more of a spot-up shooter, he looked great to start the year, hitting double figures in each of his first four games. And overall, the Jazz would go 53-29, with Starks making his return to the playoffs. But the aging Jazz ran into the young Mavs in round one and would lose the series in five. Starks would come off the bench in a game one win, then miss the following two games with a very unfortunate injury. But after recovering, he would be back in game four, as the Mavs would even the series before closing out Utah in game five. As Stark's season ended with him averaging about 9.5 points, 2 rebounds, and 2.5 and assists per game. Starks would have a much smaller role in 0-2, appearing in 66 games, but coming off the bench for all but one of them, as he would give the Jazz minimal contributions. But Utah was still able to put together a 44-38 record, which would get them a first round matchup with Sacramento. But sadly, Starks was left off of Utah's playoff roster, as they would lose to the Kings in the first round with Starks' regular season seeing him average about 4.5 points, 1 rebound, and 1 assist per game. After failing to make a team for the 0-3 season, John Starks would call it a career. It may not have had the storybook ending, but you'd be hard-pressed to write a better script than the career of John Starks. There were so many times when an NBA career seemed lost, but his almost delusional pursuit of his dream ended up with him playing over a decade in the league and going toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the best of all time. While the entire Knicks roster made up their identity in the 90s, when you think of the epitome of 90s Knicks basketball, the first guy to come to mind is John Starks. Always the underdog, and often overmatched, Starks used his competitive drive and hustle to get his own. And even though he is more remembered for some of his more infamous performances, John Starks put the Knicks in a position to win on countless occasions. Yet outside of New York, seems to be looked at as more of a pesky instigator than a legit contributor on contending teams. And yes, it's easy to hate a player like Starks, but you also need to appreciate John Starks for who he was. A perennial underdog who just kept proving people wrong. But that's it for today's episode on John Starks. Hope you enjoyed it and make sure to subscribe for more videos like this one. If you liked it, check out this one on one of his Knicks teammates. Or this one on one of his late career Golden State teammates. Thanks for watching and see you next time.